The Bible says, and there came two angels to Sodom at even. So the Bible starts out that two angels came to Sodom during evening. Now, remember that they arrived at the heat of the day at chapter 18, verse 1 through 3. So they spend most of the day there. Now they're traveling down to Sodom, and it's becoming evening. Verse 1, And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now notice right here that Lot, he, sat, he sits in the entrance of Sodom when those two angels came. Now you might say, why is Lot sitting in front of the gate? Because that was his position. Usually people who sit in front of the gate of a city are judges. Now, this can be known if you actually look at verse 9. If you look at verse 9, it says, he will needs be a judge. So, notice right here that he will needs be a judge, meaning that the guy was a judge. So, Lot was a judge that time at verse 9. At verse 9, he was a judge to the people of Sodom. We're going to look at several verses as an example. Deuteronomy 25, Deuteronomy 25, and we'll read verse 7. Deuteronomy 25, and then we'll read verse 7. Then I want your second hand to go to Ruth chapter 4, Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. Your second hand to go to the book of Ruth, and then we'll look at chapter 4. And then we'll read verse 1. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 25. And then we'll start off at verse 7. The Bible reads here, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up, raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Now, notice right here that if a person wants to judge or take care of a matter, that they were supposed to go to the gate unto the elders. Why is that? Because that's a position of judgment. We'll also look at the book of Ruth chapter 4 and verse 1. Ruth chapter 4 verse 1. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsmen of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here, and they sat down. So notice right here that up to the gate, Boaz is gathering ten men of the elders of the city because he wants them to judge for themselves. You'll notice right here at verse 9, And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Notice the last part of, uh, notice at verse 11, And all the people that were in the gate, and the elder says, We are witnesses. Okay, so notice that judgment is pronounced in front of the gate. We see another example at Job 29 and Proverbs 31. Job 29 and Proverbs 31. Again, Job 29 and Proverbs 31. I want you to look at Job 29 and verse 7. Job chapter 29, and we'll read verse 7. Notice right here that Job, he pronounces that when he goes to the gate, that there's supposed to be judgment pronounced. The Bible says, uh, verse 7, When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, the young men saw me and hid themselves, and the aged arose and stood up. So notice right here that there's a position of authority when uh, you go up to the gate, that these pe people recognize Job's position. The last one is Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 and verse 23. Proverbs 31 and verse 23. The word of God reads, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. So being in the position in front of the gate was a respectable position. It's a, a place of judgment. 
You also notice that Absalom uh, tr practiced the same way, which was why he was able to trick the people and win their hearts. Now, for some of you who are curious about that, go to 2 Samuel. We'll look at one more then, all right? We'll go to one more. 2 Samuel. We're going to look at the book of 2 Samuel. And then we'll look at chapter 15. Chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. Now notice that Absalom, he won the people's heart. He was able to trick them to turn against King David because he went to a position of authority first. Uh, but he actually, what he did was this. Look at 2 Samuel 15 verse 2. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. See that? And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, right, by the gate. But then he was blocking it. Then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. So notice that he knew that place was a position of authority, and he tried to take it for himself. All right, go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. So Lot had a pretty hefty position. You'll notice that in this place of judgment and authority, it was in front of the gate. In front of the gate was a position of judgment and authority that even Absalom himself realized. So when you're doing that in the midst of Sodom, okay? So when you're doing that in Sodom, excuse me, that's the wrong spelling. Okay? So when you're doing that in the midst of Sodom, all right, or in initials right here, then you know that you're not right with God, okay? You're not right with God. But another thing is this. Lot is supposed to be a saved person, a saved believer. How did a saved believer get a respectable position like that? You can become that way. You can become uh, a high-ranking city official. You can grab that kind of position being a saved believer. You might say, why is that? Because... The devil's job is to tempt a Christian, just like temptations run wild in this world. And even if you're a saved Christian, I know that you might have a disadvantage, but in this world of inclusivity and multiculturalism, respecting all religions and etc., anything is possible. And Christians, they mistakenly, they are so misguided to think that if they get accepted by the city, then these must be very good people. And so they're like my brethren. And you're going to find that that's what Lot called them later on. So he got brainwashed into thinking that he can be a saved believer while at the same time be a respectable position in a wicked city. You never mix church and state together, period. Politics don't go well together with religion, period. They don't go well together. You look at the next part of verse 19. Notice that Lot, he's a good, quote-unquote, Christian here. The next part of verse 19. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So Lot sees these two angels coming in front of the gate. He rises up to meet them. He bows himself with his face toward the ground. So that, like a very humble, respectable position. Uh, you'll recall that Abram did the same thing, or Abraham now. He's, his name now changed to Abraham. He is following the example that his uncle taught him, Abraham. So he respects them. Perhaps he also recognizes them as being connected to the Lord. Notice at verse 2, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. So notice, it's the same thing as chapter 18, what Abraham did. Lot is saying here, behold now, so that's a phrase that's always been 
repetitively been used from chapter 18 and 19. That's a favorite phrase. Basically, if I can have your attention here, right? Or if you can look at me at this moment, he addresses them as lords. He asks them to turn into his house. He begs them, he beseeches them. And he says, and tarry all night and wash your feet and ye shall rise up early and go on your ways. Meaning, he's saying, stay here all night long. Make sure, that you're, uh, we'll make sure that you get washed up, your feet get washed up. Usually, when people travel distances, it's respectable that you wash their feet. That's why that saying is in there, usually. And then he says, and you both can rise up early in the morning and then head on your ways, continue your journey. And they said, nay, but we will abide in the street all night. They replied and said, no, we're going to stay in the street all night long. In verse 3, and he pressed upon them greatly. So pressed is an old English word, which is not hard to understand. You know, when you say, stop pushing me, you know, you don't mean like pushing you literally, but in a sense, that uh, metaphorical phrase, stop pressuring me, don't push me, don't push me. Same thing as press, right? So notice that he's trying to pressure them. He's putting pressure on them. Pressure on them, that's why it says upon them, greatly, a lot. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. Now notice all these so-called Christian signs here. They turned inside to where he was at they entered inside his house. Lot makes a huge meal, feast, it says. He bakes unleavened bread. Same thing like his uncle Abraham did. Bakes not leaven, but unleavened bread. And they all ate together. So notice right here, the same thing like Abraham. It's not leavened bread, it's unleavened bread. Notice right here, he treats them with great hospitality. All the signs of a good deacon. You notice that? Can I repeat that again? It's all the signs of a good deacon that match to a T with chapter 18. He's a good, quote-unquote, Christian deacon who's also a respectable position in the city. How many people have I knocked on doors in visitation? And then they had respectable positions. In the community, oh yeah, I had, I'm friends with the mayor and here and there, and I'm a deacon of a church. <sighs> Blowing smoke right in front of my face, trying to show off. Don't mean anything. Look at 2 Peter. Look at 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter. Now, you know what the Bible calls him? The Bible calls him righteous man. Believe it or not, the Bible calls him righteous man. Well, maybe he was righteous. Not when you're the, in that position in Sodom, one. Number two, when you keep reading chapter 19, you'll find out he is not a really good, quote-unquote, Christian. He's not a really good saint. Especially later on when he sleeps around with his own daughters. You really fell low. That ain't a good person. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll look at verse 6. Verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. Wow, he called Lot just. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deli deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, look at that. The Bible says that God calls Lot just and righteous. And you might wonder, why is that the case? That doesn't make sense right here. Well, there are two cases. One, because he's not all the way in the crowd of Sodom and Gomorrah at verse 6. Even though he joins them, uh, out drinking and talking dirty, there's a side to him that's vexed as well. Let's be honest, uh, when, even if you're a worldly Christian sitting down with the world, there is something that bothers you. 
especially when they tell a dirty joke that relates to Jesus. Or if they say something that's totally blasphemous against the Bible and you know it's not true. Well, you know, Jesus, they say Jesus is God, but I just think he's a great man, a good teacher. I think if you put him as God, then that's just uh, too much. And then when people say stuff like that, it kind of makes you, you know, it makes you a little bit cringe, but you just get over it. You let it bypass you. So in that context, he's righteous. But there's a second one. A second reason, which is very powerful right here, is it's an example of imputation again. Imputation. Now, we've seen that demonstration with Abraham's life. Lot, he has another example here of imputation. Now, what's imputation with Lot? Imputed righteousness. Imputated. Meaning that uh, God considers you to be or gives you or counts you righteous. Even though technically you're not made righteous, he nevertheless counts you as righteous. So that's the Lord. So that's an example of New Testament Christian salvation. So a lot of people, uh, let's see, i got to squeeze this in. So there are people who go hyper-dispensational, meaning that they'll profess to be dispensationalists. But when they profess themselves to be dispensationalists, they'll use the term mid-acts, and that should scare you. Because what they do with that mid-acts is they try to start the Christian church at the middle of the book of Acts. Some even do it much after. And the reason why they try to do that, a lot of them try to go by the Apostle Paul quite often. So most of them will try to go by the Apostle Paul when he was given the gospel of salvation by grace, and they want to match with his timing or close to his timing. So because of that, they'll say that there is no such thing as New Testament Christian salvation by grace, not by works, until the Apostle Paul, which is false. There are demonstrations in the Old Testament where, here's one example, Lot, he was considered just and righteous. He was considered just and righteous. There ain't no salvation by works right here. His works definitely failed. But God considered him just and righteous. Now, uh, do we believe in dispensational salvations? Absolutely. Dispensational salvations, what that means is we believe that in the Old Testament there was a different salvation, which was salvation by faith and works. Whereas in the New Testament, when Jesus died on the cross, after we passed the transition of the book of Acts, Paul, he was revealed the gospel, and then at that time it became more publicly well-known about salvation by grace, not by works. Well, then you just contradicted yourself, your pastor, right? No, the thing is this, is that generally in the Old Testament, and we've seen so many cases of that, there are so many cases in the Old Testament, the general rule is faith and works. But there were in those middle, sometimes God dropped little glimpses of grace down there and granted salvation by grace here and there. Now, let's look at John 1. John 1 is a, the best example of this. John 1. It's like, for example, uh, when you go to the workplace, they'll lay down a rule, right? They'll lay down a rule for you that you have to come to work uh, by 8 a.m. Otherwise, uh, I don't know, you might get dock points or something, or they'll look down on you more. Uh, not, not every job's like that, but sometimes uh, that's the kind of general rule, right? People know that they shouldn't come late, right? That's like a general rule in their minds. But let's be honest, weren't there those moments here and there that people drop by late? Why? Because the boss or the leader or the superior or even the workplace itself understands and can give a little grace on that one because of some scenarios or situations. See, that's just common sense and normal in life. Now, I don't understand why people find that hard to believe. That's pretty common sense in life. 
I don't know why people have a hard time and they'll say, well, that's too hard to understand. You're calling exceptions to the rule, glimpses of grace. No, it's called being amateur and you're not looking at yourself or you're probably jobless. You don't have a job and you never experienced that. Right. Yeah. All right, let's look at John 1. John 1. You'll find out some of these people are like that, pale in the face and then, yeah. you know, they just sit down at home, do nothing, you know, and just wear a sweater all day long. And then they think they're professionals and they know much about dispensationalism or dispensational salvation. Let's look at John 1. We'll look at verse 16. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by, by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now notice right here, that uh, grace and truth came at the timeline when Jesus came in. Yes. Because when he died on the cross, he was able to offer salvation by grace, not by works. But you'll notice that verse 16, it says fullness. Yeah. It's a fullness of his grace we received and grace for grace. Yeah. Why, why is that? This grace that Jesus brought down is different yes. compared to other grace before. So see, that means God did give grace throughout the Bible. A great example, which we read before, was Genesis 6. Uh, you don't have to look at that, but uh, we studied that before Genesis 6. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's be honest, there was grace during that time. All right, go back to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. So notice right here that he's a very good deacon. He does all these signs of what a good Christian deacon should. But nevertheless, he was wicked. He still lived a sinful life. So what is Lot a great example of? He is a great example of Christians today. If there are several people that you want to know, one of the best ones is Lot. He's a great example of a worldly Christian. He is a worldly Christian. He is granted imputed righteousness, meaning that... Uh, he is a saved believer. So notice right here that he is a great example of a saved Christian who's considered righteous in the eyes of Jesus Christ, but nevertheless, he is of the world. Now, uh, I would like to ask great comfort, Paul Washer, John MacArthur that. They don't believe in such a thing as a carnal Christian? Really? They don't believe in such a thing as a worldly Christian? Lot's a great example of that one. But notice right here, God called him righteous and just, but he committed a wicked sin like incest. Now, if a person committed that kind of sin, I wonder if some of you would think, man, is that, that guy must be a saved believer, right? And then these are the same people, Ray Comfort, Paul Washer, John MacArthur, and these guys, these are the same people who judge you by your church attendance, your lack of church attendance, and your lack of reading the scriptures as you're not a saved believer. Come on, man. Who are you kidding? Lot, he committed really wicked sins right here. Yeah. But he was considered to be a saved Christian. But his problem is he, is he was worldly. So look at Matthew 6. Matthew 6. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to look at 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, Matthew 6, and 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you think that you can be a saved Christian while messing around with the world, then you are dead wrong. You are dead wrong. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot do that. Uh, the Bible says that you'll either love the one or hate the other. You can't say, I love Jesus and I love San Fran Sodom, okay? You can't say that. I'm being watched online. So you can't say that you love the city. You can't say you love Sodom and Jesus Christ. That's impossible. Yeah, you cannot do that. If you automatically say, I love Sodom, that means you hate Jesus Christ. God automatically considers it that way. You might say, really? Why is that? Because the more that you love the wicked world, the more it looks like hatred to God. It's like, for example, would you say that your mom and dad really loved you if they were negligent of you? 
No, you don't say that they really love you. Okay, if liberals have that kind of common sense, why can't you think that way about the Lord? If you're negligent of God, do you really love God? Look at your church attendance. Look at your reading of the scriptures, your prayer time. All right, let's look at uh, Matthew 6. Notice right here at verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon, meaning you cannot live wickedly while serving God. Go to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. Notice there is such a thing as a Christian who seeks after the world. He can be a saved believer, but he seeks after the world. Verse 10, 2 Timothy 4.10. For a demon hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. So he, forsake, he forsook the ministry because he loved the world. That's why look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. It is so important that you don't love the world. His problem is that he loved the world. What he was supposed to do is he's supposed to hate the world. That's what he's supposed to do. But instead, what did he do? He disobeyed God and it turned out to be hating God. So if you're a saved Christian, you're supposed to love not the world. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why? If any man love the world, see, if you automatically love the world, what does the Bible say? The love of the Father is not in him. Automatically, you don't have the love of God in you. You have to understand that. Okay, go back to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. So this was Lot's problem. He's a very good Christian at verses 1 through 3. But the Bible says that it doesn't matter about that. He actually does not love the Lord. He actually loved the world. So then we'll see right here, you know, the, a saved believer always looks at verses 2 to 3. A worldly Christian will always look at verses 2 to 3 and say that about themselves. Yeah. They won't look at verse 1. And they won't look at verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. When you read those rest of the verses, you'll think that Lot, that he's a, he's a poor example of a Christian. A sissy that I ever saw in all my life of a Christian. So that's your problem. You have to look at yourself and, you know, why do you think you're a good Christian? Because you, you always look at two things, verse 2 and 3. That's all you look at. But you don't count all those bad things that you do, that you let God down. And if you were to write that list, you'd realize that you're a poor example of a Christian and you're worldly. You're worldly. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 4. But before they lay down, so before they lay down, right, before they rested, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round. So the men of Sodom right here, notice it says men, right? It doesn't say women. It says men. So we know what kind of lifestyle they were practicing. Okay? But it'll become more plain if we read it. The men in the city of Sodom compassed. See, it's like a compass itself, an instrument like a compass. So what does it do? It surrounds, right? So they were surrounding the house. Why would they surround the house? They must be harmless people. These were the people holding up signs, crying out BLM. And love and peace, we really love those dudes inside the house. Send them out that we might know them. So we can teach them a little bit of education in our schools. Okay. So notice the age right here. Older, mature people. Is that what verse 4 said? It says both old and what? Wow. These kind of people grab for younger people. Younger age people. Okay? That's what they do. They don't care. They could care less. Old or young. They want everybody. All the people from every quarter. Oh, now they're surrounding from every quarter, everywhere. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? 
So then they're calling out to Lot, and, they're, and they said to him, hey, where are those men that came to you that night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So bring them out so that we can get to know them. Now, that's not a friendly knowing. Okay, guys? That's not a friendly knowing. You'll notice right here that at verse 8, that's not a friendly knowing. If you look at verse 8, Lot knew exactly what the knowing was. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. Well, that's pretty plain right there. So see, we can see that uh, they were sodomites. They practiced that wicked lifestyle. And they wanted to uh, sexually enforce the angels to sleep with them. So in verse 6, And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. So he went out, he went at the door to approach them then he shuts the door after him, right? So it's kind of like this, after him. So he shuts the door behind him. Now, we can guess right here that Lot knew from verse 6, 7, 8 what those sodomites would do to the two angels. He's not stupid. He, can, he knew that from verse 5 as well when they said, bring them out that we might know them. Which is possible that at verse 1 through 3, the reason why he wanted them to sleep at his place. He pressured them that. Why? Because when the angel said at verse 2, we're going to sleep at the street all night, you know what that means, right? That's dangerous. If someone said that to you, like we're going to sleep in the streets of SF all night, are you going to go, oh, it's a safe place, they're loving, tolerant people, or are you going to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You think this is a city of love, joy, and peace? You're kidding me, man. Look at the fruits. Yeah, right. Even the people who live in that city know that they wouldn't dare to sleep out in the streets all night long. Yeah. <laughs> That's the fruits. So uh, don't let this public education system blind you. Right. It blinds you so much that you're, you're so blinded from seeing the obvious. Yep. The obvious. Why? You just cover it with a little bit of intellectualism right. and then you'll be blinded from what's common sense and what's obvious. Right. I would like to ask you this question. If there was no published school, if there was no TV to influence and brainwash you, I really wonder when you live in this place for a long time how your belief system might view things differently. Okay. Anyways, maybe common sense might kick in a bit more, right? It's called common sense. What's common sense? Common sense is what's common around you, not virtual, re, uh, virtual fantasy in front of a TV when a guy dresses up in a suit and has no degrees behind him, let alone a doctorate, and tells you how you should live your everyday life. Especially a joker who acts like an immature brat and has a show named after him and tells you how politics should run and go and people laugh and think that's truth. Right. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> what a brainwashed world we live in. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, man. Suckers born every minute, man. So messed up. We're so brainwashed nowadays. Okay. Now look at verse 7. So Lot says to them, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So Lot says uh, to the Sodomites, I pray you, he's begging them, I pray you Sodomites, I pray you wicked people, God judge you sinner. No, I pray you brethren, do not so wickedly. He's telling those Sodomites, he calls them brethren, please don't do this wicked thing, he's saying. Oh, he fell apart, man. <laughs> he fell apart. This guy, he had a strong and mighty position, and this guy called them brethren. Why? You're my best friend. Hey, I would like to, uh, this might convict some of you saved Christians, who's your best friend? Do you have a best friend? Did you even give them the gospel? Him or her? Come on, yeah. Come on brother. Call them brethren, huh? You know, uh, that's what 
uh, Lot did. He treated them as brethren. No, the Bible says that they're enemies. If you're not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you are considered an enemy of God. Yeah. People say, why would God let a person burn in hell forever? You're right. It doesn't make sense that a loving God will let a person burn in hell forever unless he has such hatred and wrath, mm -hmm. unless he views that person as an enemy, right. not as someone he loves. Right. But I thought he loved all the world that he died on the cross yeah, he died on the cross because he loved you enough so that he can offer you salvation. If you come to Calvary and receive it, you accept that love because the only time he shed that love was on the cross. But if you reject the cross, you're rejecting his love. And that's your fault if you get the wrath and hatred of God on you, not God's. Why? Because God's not going to force you. He believes in free choice. He's going to let you make your own decision. So he calls them brethren. Now look at verse 8. Behold now, so that's a favorite phrase used. We've seen that many times. I'm not going to explain it again. I have two daughters which have not known man. So he has two daughters that did not know men sexually. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. Now that's just sick, man. He says, let me, I beg you. I beg you? Come on, man. What insane father would say, I beg you, let me bring out my daughters and then you can do whatever you want to them. I beg you, please. You're cuckoo, man. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Now, that ain't a good Christian right there. If, uh, I, I wonder, uh, Ray Comfort saw this person and this person says that, you know, I, I prostitute my daughters, you know, and then Ray Comfort, you'd say, he would say, you're not a saved believer. You're going to hell, right? Well, in this case, verse 8, Lot acted like that, and he's a saved believer. Now, people think I'm so hard on Ray Comfort, but the reason why I keep pounding him is because this guy has a widespread influence online. I know some of you know this guy. That's why I have to name him. All right, I don't name every cat and dog on the street. I only name people who have a widespread reach on people that have brainwashed them. So then people think that, well, Ray Comforts, he teaches salvation by grace through faith, not by works. He's a good guy. No, because he stresses so much on repentance over sin, and because of that, he has chased away people from salvation, and that's not genuine salvation by grace through faith. Do we condone sin? No. Did you hear me condoning sin all this time in Genesis 19? I pounded sin. I pounded sin. But I don't like it that you have to mingle what, your clean living with salvation. Why? Yeah. Not because I don't like it or I like it. It's more so I don't like it because of what the Bible says. The Amen. Bible says salvation is faith alone in Jesus Christ. I do believe in repentance, but come on now. I don't believe that you have to go through a checkmark list yeah. of all sorts of sins and the only sin that you have to turn away from is that when you turn it over to Jesus Christ and let his blood wash it away for you, you don't turn from it yourself. You're doing it yourself, and then you can believe on Jesus Christ. You're doing a work. All right? Now, I ain't going to pound on Lordship Salvation, okay? I got to resume on here, okay? I got to pound this sinner right here. He continues on in verse 8, Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So Lot's saying, Only to these two men don't do anything to them. Don't harm them. Why? Therefore, the reason why is because they're under the shadow of my roof. They're my guests. So meaning it's like a protection. So they're protected. They're under my haven. Verse 9, And they said, Stand back. So they told Lot to stand back. Get out of the way. And they said again, so they say again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs be a judge. So they called him a fellow. They're saying, this guy here. Yeah. See, so that's pretty rude, all right? That's not very loving of them, I guess, okay? And they get upset whatever name call we call them, right? You know, And they don't hesitate to say F you, right? And name call you. <laughs> loving people yeah yeah amen amen okay and they'll teach you what kind of words or names yeah, yeah. that you should use 
because it's called hate speech and they don't hesitate to say F you, F you, F you, right? Devils, man. This one fellow came into sojourn, meaning that uh, he came in where he's not really one of us, a citizen. All right, he came, he came here to just sojourn. Remember that term is like traveling through. Okay, it's just bypassing, just temporarily staying. And he will needs be a judge. So they're saying, oh, who's making him a judge? He thinks that he has to be a judge of this matter. And you can tell that matches with verse 1 because of Lot's job, see? Because he's a job, judge. Uh, they, don't, they don't fear. They don't get afraid. Why? Oh, you just get Roe versus Wade. You, let's see them very fearful of approaching judges' homes. I don't see them fearful. See, this is the kind of demon-possessed people that you get. You know, this is, yeah, I'm hitting home. I'm hitting home, all right? You know why? This pictures, no doubt, we're living in there, okay? We are living in there, okay? What men learn from history, and I would like to put Bible here, is that men never learn from history. My goodness, man. Just open up the Bible and read it one time. And then see how it matches so well with today's current events. You don't need to dig up online to catch up with your current events. No, if I were you, I'd get away from that. It's enough brainwashing. I get into that book. It's more current event than ever. Okay, now the next part of verse 9. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. So they're saying, oh, be, uh, because of your actions, what you did, we're going to deal with you worse than what we were going to do to those two angels. Okay, those two men. And they pressed sore upon the man. So they were pushing real sore. So that's self-explanatory. On Lot, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So they pressured so hard. So when there's a mob, it's not a peaceful protest. Okay? Yeah. It's about to break down the door. Yeah. Oh, don't lie to me and say, no, 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 they're peaceful protesters. Yeah. No, why do you bolt your door? Why do you yeah. lock it? Yeah. Huh? Why do you stay at home? You coward, if you think they're peaceful protesters, why don't you go outside, okay? Yeah, there you go. And unlock the door, open it, and yeah. wish them a Merry Christmas and welcome them inside. <laughs> See, they, they lost common sense right. because of TV and the school system today. You get those two things, brainwashes you every single time. Success, success. They lost common sense. Verse 10, but the men put forth their hands. So these angels, which are men, they, they, they start to put their hand to work. You know, they could have put their hand to work all that time. Why didn't they took, take action? I think they wanted Lot to see. Yeah. How his compromising with the world and with Christianity can end things peacefully. It didn't. Lot tried to compromise. See that? I'm going to do my Christian thing by treating these two preachers very well. Give offering, wash their feet, and help out the church while I try to get along with the world. No, you, you won't succeed. And the Lord will let you do that. Keep playing with the world. And with church, all you want, you're not going to succeed. And you know it. And you know it. Put, uh, the men put forth their hand, so it's like this, right? And pulled Lot into the house to them, so that's self-explanatory, and shut to the door. So that's a phrase that's used. They could have just said shut the door, but they said shut to the door. Uh, why do they word it that way? Because that's an English phrase, and that's still used in the South, believe it or not, shut to the door. So uh, the phrase does not have to be updated because there are people who still use that phrase today. So it's self-explanatory. They shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness. So then they smote, so they struck, that's the idea. They struck them with blindness. They hit them with blindness. So the men that were at the door of that house, they were all blind, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. So uh, small and great populace right there. So whether they were small guys or big guys themselves, it didn't matter. They blinded everybody. And then they, were, uh, they, were, they wearied themselves finding the door. They tired themselves out trying to find the doorknob. Now, if it was one or two people, 
you could probably find the door, right? But look, when you get like hundreds of people struck with blindness, and then everyone talking and shouting and, hey, I grabbed so-and-so. This is the guy. And they beat up the wrong person, you know. <laughs> and then they're going like this and grabbing everything out there. And then one guy saying, no, 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 I'm not the guy. You're beating the wrong guy. And they said, you liar. And then it's chaotic. Yeah. It's chaotic. So that's why they couldn't find the door. So it wouldn't make sense. Verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? So then they're asking him right here. The men is speaking to Lot. They're saying, Do you have anybody here besides, right? So besides who? Besides uh, you and your family. Is there anyone else out there? That's the idea. Do you have anyone else besides you? Son-in-law... Uh, besides here, right? That's the idea. So everyone here, do you have anyone else besides the people in here? So this shows that Lot, he had extra family members. Remember, the ones that are inside his, district, uh, his home are his wife and two daughters. So then who are the ones besides them? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters. So then they're asking him, do you have son-in-law out there or sons out there? Or other daughters, not just the two that he had then. So he had four daughters, that would mean, because we're going to read it later on. And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. They're saying, whatever you have here in the city, get them out of this place. For we will destroy this place. Wow, that's an unloving God. I thought uh, these people are loving, peaceful world filled with tolerance. I mean, they tolerated an immigrant right here named Lot, so why won't the Lord tolerate them? So the, the two angels, you can see they were very unloving. They say, we're going to destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. So remember that metaphor that was explained before, okay? That figure of speech, the cry of them is waxing great, meaning that the cry of the innocent that's in this city, has increased so much greatly before the Lord's face. So it increased up to heaven. I already explained that part. So notice that they weren't loving, peaceful people. All right? You know, the cry is waxing great in this place. Oh, no, it's not. It's not. Then why are you moving out, stupid? Okay. So, yeah, because there's a lot of... Remember, the cry is referring to the grievance, the suffering. Now, I don't know how much plainer I have to get or I have to appeal to your common sense here. Let's keep reading. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So notice right here, the angel said, the Lord sent us to destroy this place. And Law went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters. Ah, so we see right here, it's more than one son-in-law, sons-in-law. So at the very least, two sons-in-law which married his daughters, so at the very least two of his daughters, right? So then he had to go to their places and warn them. So if he has two daughters here at the very least, then you count the other two daughters that are already with him at verse 8. So he has four daughters, that means, okay? So he has four daughters. So he's speaking to his sons-in-law and his daughters and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. So notice that Lot went... Finally, visitation for the first time in his life, because he was too scared to do that in, San Fran in Sodom, because he thought that was unloving and that people would call him crazy. So he finally did street preaching the first time in his life, and he said, uh, up, so meaning get up, right? So don't just stay here, like get up, all right? Get you out of this place, get out of this place. Because why? The Lord's going to destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons, sons-in-law. So Lot appeared as a person that was mocking to his sons-in-law. So to his sons-in-law, Lot appeared like he was mocking. He was making a joke. Right? Oh, I'm afraid to tell them that they're, the Lord's going to destroy them and burn them with hell fire because uh, they're going to mock me. And well, one way or another, you will. One way or the other, you will be mocked. What do you think? You might as well face that mockery, knocking on the door, 
and tell them about Jesus Christ and tell them how to get saved from hell. You're going to get mocked one day. You might as well get it over with right now, okay? Rather than later, because later would be too late. If he did this much earlier, maybe he would have persuaded them more. Now he lost his family. All right? If you don't think you're a worldly Christian, and what I'm saying is too mean everything about uh, the city here and Sodom and everything, then all you have to do is just look at yourself right here in verse 14 and ask yourself this. Were you truly a good person, a good Christian, a loving Christian that uh, you never even told your own family members how to be saved from hell? They're going to burn in hell forever. You realize that? Now, if you really care for your family, you tell them how to get saved from hell. You tell them how to go to heaven after they die. No, you don't care about your family. You only care about yourself at chapter 19. All Lot was caring about was himself. The evidence is, verse 8, he could care less about his two girls. You want the evidence? There are parents today... Uh, there are younger generations today that complain about their parents today. Why? Because the parents ne were negligent on their part, and liberals even admit that. Now, if that be the case, that uh, that was the case with the parents today, that they're negligent, that they don't really care for the family, how did parents end up that way today, I wonder? Worldly. They always cared about themselves. They never really cared for their children. Now, am I putting people under conviction here? I'm hitting this hard because we're living in the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah today, you have to understand. And I believe it, does ha it did affect some of us, unfortunately. That's why I'm kicking this really hard because uh, usually when preachers preach hard, they talk about themselves sometimes. You have to understand. I'm trying to kick this out of my system. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, so the morning rose up, so Lot couldn't persuade them. So the angels, they hurried Lot, that's the idea, they hastened, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So they say, Arise, so that means get up, right? Take your wife, your two daughters that are here, otherwise you're going to be consumed, burned, up with the sin of the city. Now notice that uh, God, he, when he burns up the people in the city, he's burning up the iniquity, the sin. Why would God let people, lost sinners, burn in hell forever? Simple, because the iniquity is in them. You can't get rid of your own iniquity yourself, no matter how much good works you practice in your life. That's why you need to humble yourself and say, I need Jesus Christ to wash away my sins. Let him get rid of the iniquity. If not, then you will be consumed. Verse 16, and while he lingered, so while uh, uh, Lot lingered, right? So he's lingering. So he's hesitating, right? The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Okay, meaning right here that the men, they laid hold on his hand, okay? They grabbed his hand, they grabbed his wife's hand, the hand of his two daughters, and what brought him forth and set them, put them outside of the city. That's the idea. Why did the Lord do that? Because he's merciful to law. So a lot of times when the Lord, uh, you know, why would the Lord, you know, force this thing to happen where I lose the world? I lost my worldly friends, my, my worldly job, my worldly home and all that. Maybe the Lord's being merciful to you because he's about to burn you up to a fair thee well. Now, a lot of times Christians will whine and cry and say, oh, God, don't, don't take this away from me, this worldly thing. I know it's not good and stuff like that. Maybe you're going to burn up to a cinder one day. And it was the Lord's mercy that he grabbed your hand and took you out of there. Now, I know that every one of us has experienced that sometime in our lives before. And that's an example of the Lord's mercy. That's the Lord loving you, man. Okay, look at verse 17. And it came to pass, okay, that's self-explanatory, so what happened next, right? When they had brought them forth abroad, so when they brought the family abroad, right, out there, 
to spread uh, throughout out there that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. All right, so it's saying right here, escape for your life, like run for your life. Don't look behind you. That's important. That's a command right there, not an option. It says, don't look behind you. And they also told him, don't stay in all the plain. Now, isn't that interesting? So not just in the city, don't stay in the plain. Now, what was Lot's mistake at the beginning? Do you remember? At Genesis 13, he didn't go inside the city of Sodom. Remember, he was, no, I'm not, I'm not moving to San Francisco. I'm right here in the plain of Carmel right here, this nice little town, middle of no man's land. And it's so beautiful out here. It's pleasant. The Lord wouldn't burn this place, you know? God said, no, get you out of the whole stinking Bay Area because I'm going to burn all of that to a cinder and a fare thee well. I might burn up half a Big Sur too because they're just getting over there, you know, something like that, okay? Did I say that? Uh, <laughs> it was a joke. It's a joke, okay? All right, let's, uh, let's, let's go back right here. So he, they say, escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed. So he wants him to run away to the mountains up there. So they're going to burn everything surrounding it. They're going to burn everything. Otherwise, he's going to be consumed. He's going to be burned up. And Lot said unto them, ah, the worldly Christian, right? So Lot says to him, oh, not so, my Lord. That's a worldly Christian is what? Being sorrowful. Another sign of a worldly Christian right here. So let's put a list. is being sorrowful in losing the world. Why? Because you love the world. See that? But you're sorrowful in losing the world even if God is going to punish it. Now, uh, I don't know if anyone's under conviction here. But that's why you still cling on to that worldly thing. There are some things in your Christian life that you're still messing around with, and you don't care if God's going to judge you for it. Right. And you go, oh, not so, God. Yeah. Good. Good We're easy to bash the sodomites right here, but we've got to realize the main character, the main attention in this passage is not the sodomites. Right. It's a worldly Christian. Yeah. Basically, you... Yeah, amen, amen, all right? Verse 19, Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy. Oh, now look at this. This guy, <laughs> oh, he knows doctrine. Why? Because he attended Bible Baptist Church, and he heard the secrets of prayer from Pastor Kim. And he's like, he decides to use this line on the Lord so that he can persuade God to answer his prayer. And guess what? God can answer your prayer. And guess what? You don't want that. Come on, brother. That's right. That's Notice he used these signs. So it is a, oh yeah, you get your doctrine straight. You Bible believer, you. You're just as worldly as a rotten stick that's headed for hell. Just as any lost sinner in this community. Just because you know truth doesn't mean that you're living right. Yeah. Hey, onliners. Hello, you're watching? Just because you know truth doesn't make you right. How is your actions? No different from them. So notice right here, he has that knowledge uh, on how to persuade the Lord. He, call, he humbles his health. I'm a servant and I found grace in your sight. And you showed, you increased your mercy on me. Remember that, Lord? So he's hitting on his attributes, see? Which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. So... Notice that he's kind of thanking the Lord. He doesn't really thank him, but he's kind of like thanking the Lord. You know, you use your grace and mercy that you showed me in saving my life. Why? Because you know that's a trick in persuading God. You have to thank him. And I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil take me and I die. God, don't take away this worldly thing. Because cause what? Because I'm going to die. No, you're still alive. You're still breathing. You think you're going to die. 
Lot says, I can't run away to the mountain because I'm afraid that uh, some evil, some kind of evil thing is over there and they're going to kill me and I'm going to die. Okay, let's uh, stop it right here. All right, we'll continue on. Verse 20 through 26. So I'll explain the next part, the rest of this drawing. We didn't, I didn't explain the rest of this drawing, but I hope that uh, you got a good preaching today because I got another sermon right after this. So I hope you got right with the Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. It was pretty hard. Uh, we kick sin very hard today, Heavenly Father. But I pray that the people, they'll understand that it is quite necessary because uh, perhaps they haven't heard anyone kick sin so hard all their lives before. And perhaps this will be a good first time for them because we tolerated sin far too long now. And we have treated it not as evil as it should be, Heavenly Father. So I pray that today's teaching has opened our eyes to not love the world, to not be a part of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.